Hello and welcome to News Click. We are going to discuss with Bappa Sinha, who has been an expert, shall we say, on embedded systems, software, and has looked at the EVM question quite closely. In the light of the claims made yesterday by Mr. Shuja in a press conference in London in front of the former minister, incidentally also the science and technology minister, and later on the HRD minister in the earlier UPA regime. Mr. Kapil Sibbal. Bapa, this has now become a high profile, shall we say, uh, expose of the EVM with cameras, with television stations all across the country, some of them even giving live coverage to the event. I think the Quint was doing a live coverage of the event. And today we have the, again, uh, the Minister of Information Technology, uh, Mr. Prasad, reacting to it. So it's become a very high-level circus, shall we say. Before we go into the circus itself, the media circus around this, let's talk about what was the story that was presented by Mr. Shuja. How do you characterize this? Because there are technological claims, there are claims about what happened, and there are claims even about the position of his heart in the body. So how do you look at all of this? I think it, it went from, at least from the pre-announcement, which was supposed to be a serious event, but it degenerated very quickly into a B-grade Bollywood <laughs> movie script and from there to a comedy spoof. I mean, that's the only way to describe it. it. It was, watching it was a surreal experience. I don't think there is any other word to describe it. So I had switched on to that channel, uh, Quinn's channel, expecting that there would be EBM, some things would be done to it. And then we could clarify our doubts on the authenticity of the EVM or something. But so you, the, there was no EVM. The guy showed up. The guy didn't show up. He he was on a Skype call from the from some location uh, his, in the United States. Not Mr. Shuja. Mr. Shuja was in, on Skype. He was not in London. Oh, he was not in London. No, no, no he was not. He, he was he was in some location on Skype, uh, and his eyes and most of his face were blacked out. In a dark room, it looked like a spy thriller kind of thing. And he claimed that he couldn't come to London because he had been attacked, that, that the government had found out that he was going to do this expose and somebody had disclosed his location and he, there was th somebody tried to kill him and he escaped. And so that's why he couldn't travel. And his story was that the EVMs couldn't come because the people who were supposed to carry the EVMs, they got co-opted by the government and so they, they sold out. So that was his story. So basically he had nothing to show. And then he came up with this fantastic story that he was part of ECIL. Uh, ECIL is the PSU which manufactures EVM for one of the two PSUs. One of the two PSUs. Uh, manufactures uh, EVMs for um, the Election Commission. So apparently he used to work in ECIL in Hyderabad. And in 2013, I think that's what he said. In 2013, um, somebody approached him. Um, uh, under the directions of Gopinath Munde, he named BJP leader Gopinath Munde, and uh, they said that um, uh, this team should hack EVMs with the purpose of um, dis uh, uh, discovering loopholes in the EVM so that they can do better EVM. So their team apparently uh, hacked the EV successfully hacked the EVM and disclosed that information to their whoever had given them the assignment. And uh, with the expectation that the EVMs would better EVMs would be created, and then he claims that uh, no better EVMs were created. In, instead, these hacks were utilized to massively rig the 2014 election, um, using. Um, uh, well, we'll get to the technology later. But before that, he said that then on 12th of May, the entire team was called to some office in Hyderabad, where everybody was shot and everybody, every, uh, the, the BJP, some BJP leader ordered um, somebody to shoot at everybody, all his team members died. He somehow survived because the bullet went through his chest out of his body, but because his heart was uh, uh, inverted heart. <laughs> it was not on the left, but on the right. Apparently there is some heart condition where your heart could be flipped. Yeah. Right. So, uh, and so even though the bullet went through his chest, it missed the heart. Uh, but uh, he went unconscious and then somehow got up and started running, <laughs> like out of a spy thriller. 
it's not uh, like a uh, high quality spy thriller it's out of a rajnikanth movie <laughs> rajnikanth james bond i think is the scale of the production <laughs> rather than the storyline but coming to what you said apart from shall we say the complete implausibility of the scale of events of a team being shot him escaping being able to escape with all this knowledge leaving all of this out let's look at the technical claims made that somehow it is possible using low frequency uh, radio waves to apparently rig the election in somebody's favor or the other is that the claim technical claim being made the, the story makes no sense right but his story is that these evms uh, even though they were designed long back for some reason they had uh, radio transmitters and receivers uh, why would somebody making evms in 1980s under congress rule put the radio transmitters and receivers and congress would be unaware of this till 2014 is is left unexplained but apparently they had radio transmitters and receivers and uh, these transmitters and receivers were transmitting uh, radio signals at very low frequencies right uh, at 7 to 300 hertz that uh, 390 hertz that's what he mentioned uh, so you have to understand that most of our communication right when you use a cell phone wifi these are in gigahertz range uh, so um, that's where most conventional radio used to be megahertz range. right right uh, uh, yeah so uh, but our modern communication is mostly in gigahertz range and 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 the um, and these very lo- low frequency ranges it it's it's difficult to use them uh, primarily because um look the 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 frequency uh, like is a uh, inversely proportional to the wavelength right so so the smaller the frequency the, the larger higher the wavelength right. and therefore if you want to find the frequency the information from the frequency therefore you need a longer Uh, essentially a uh, 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 antenna antenna right so your cell phone because this is a small device has to have a antenna which is very small and hence the uh, the the frequency has to be very large for your cell phone to be reliably getting that signal now uh, look at at um, uh, if you do some like just wikipedia search at 7 uh, uh, hertz the 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 antenna required would very well be the size of india right um, at 400 hertz right he said 390 but let's at 400 hertz it would be a few kilometers that's the size of the antenna right uh, uh, there's an interesting um, like i was doing a search google search yesterday there's an interesting project uh, which happened in wisconsin in the mid 80s they build a they build a, a radio transmission system uh, at 70 to 80 hertz and uh, there the antennas spanned almost the entire state of wisconsin so 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 they had antennas at two locations across the state of wisconsin covered by a uh, connected by a wire and that's how they could do this so um, now to assume that this would somehow be miniaturized and put inside a a a chip it simply means that violating the laws of physics it, it, by, yeah. <laughs> apart from the technology implausibility it's simply a violation of the laws of physics and uh, we are not surprised by somebody sitting in a dark room making an astounding claim that happens all the time what is really astounding is that we had a congress minister in the in that place sort of organizing the press conference if not organizing giving it credibility he went i believe two or three days before the event to be there and then of course this being picked up by all the channels uh, shall we say without due diligence right congress has now backtracked right i mean this has been such a embarrassment that they backtracked and they said that kapil sibal went there uh, on his in his own capacity <laughs> nothing to do with congress uh but look i mean we all knew the congress uh, that that um this was uh, had the tacit approval of congress in some way a uh, lot of media both digital media and tv channels some tv channels were there so uh, it's just astonishing right look i mean if you compare it with it's not like there there haven't been whistleblowers before who made 
stunning claims, right? I mean, just like in the past decade, you had um, Assange and, and Snowden make really claims which were mind blowing, right? I mean, Snowden we walks out of that NSA facility and gives you this documentation, but he doesn't come like the first thing he doesn't do is do a press conference. He first gives you reams of documentation and you read that and, and you're stunned and then you interview him, right? You don't get a random character and sitting in a dark room, <laughs> sitting in a dark room <coughs> without, without any evidence and give him the this kind of exposure and credibility. This is uh, it's something about our Indian uh, psyche or, or like lack of scientific temper. <laughs> <laughs> has something to do with that. You know, it's also, I, I think it's also interesting, the press relied that a due diligence should have been made by Mr. Simple. And whatever the Congress say, therefore the belief, at least on the media, I think, was that if Mr. Simple is giving it a credibility, after all, don't forget, he's not only a lawyer, he was also, as I said, the science and technology minister, okay, irrespective of his science and technology, uh, shall we say, understanding. So for him to give it that credibility by being there, the only parallel I can, it reminds me of is uh, Mr. Gulzarila Nanda, <laughs> when he was the acting prime minister uh, for a very brief while, he had allowed a Hatha Yogi uh, to have an experiment in which he would walk across water. Uh, he had the ability, he claimed, to walk across water. So Mr. Nanda was there as acting prime minister, therefore the de facto prime minister, the de jure prime minister, if you will, at that point, and the entire media was there to see Hatha Yogi perform this miracle. Unfortunately for both Mr. Nanda and the Gulza and the Hatha Yogi, he went right through. <laughs> now, uh, Mr. Simple seems to have done exactly something very similar. Fortunately, he's no longer the science and technology minister, though the current science and technology minister, Harshvardhan, has not acquitted himself any better in his seat of ministerial seat, so to say, by what he's been sang, talking about in the Science Congress, and what Mr. Modi has talked about in the Science Congress. But this is quite quite amazing. But leaving no, that no, out to the time. It is, like, it is as if BJP and Congress are in this competition of being, who is the dumbest, right? <laughs> the, 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 the dumb, dumb and dumb. What is this dumb and dumb <laughs> film? You know, <laughs> Leaving this aside, there have also been serious questioning of the EVM. And we have, I think, discussed earlier that technologically we can never say a piece of technology designed or built by any organization is hack-proof. Meaning that if you take the EVM, we know it's like a calculator chip. It has, shall we say, uh, burnt in itself the program. So if the program is not something which can be reprogrammed or changed by an instra combination of keystrokes from an external device, it's really burnt into the chip. It is possible that you can hack this machine if you change the chip, for example. This has been what the ARP demonstration was about. Look, any machine is hackable. So is hackable. What does it mean to hack a machine? It, it means that uh, if it's a, if, if it's a computer-like machine, then, then it has hardware and a software. So either you modify the software or you modify the hardware. Now, even if it's a not a digital machine, let's say you have a, a, a doll with a bobbly head. Now, if you open the doll up and remove the spring under the head, and uh, then it stops bobbling. Now, so you've hacked the doll, right? So any machine can be hacked. So that is not being contested. Uh, the, the question is, given the EC's administrative procedures, given the scale at which Indian elections happen, right? So I think um, uh, like, let's say a state like uh, Bengal, um, um, I think has about 75,000 or 77,000 polling booths. That means that 77,000 EVMs are deployed only in the state of Bengal, right? And, and so in, like across the country, if, if you have the 2014 elections being hacked, uh, we are roughly looking, I think, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but somewhere in the range of 1.5 to 2 million EVMs which are deployed to conduct the elections. So uh, in order to hack uh, it at that large scale. I think the number is about 3.2 some lakhs. That means 320,000, 330,000. No, 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 much larger. Much larger, because, because much larger. UP, it's, look, UP has 
400 um, constituencies, right? And um, typically, every constituency. Assembly. Assembly constituency. Is about 80. Yeah, it, but it doesn't matter. So every assembly constituency has roughly 250 booths. Uh, so if you multiply um, 200, um, uh, um, uh, sorry, 400 constituencies times um, 250 booths, that itself is, um, I think, close to uh, close to um, 100,000. Yeah, that, that that itself is close to one. So, so one state itself is very close to um, Bengal. I know is about seventy-seven thousand. Um, Rajasthan is about fifty-one thousand. Okay, so if you add uh, all, all entire India, they were really looking about two million. One point five to two million. That that's the and in that, if for, you have to be able to hack a substantial number, of, or at least let's say ten percent of the EVMs to be able to change the result at a, at a national level or, or even at a state level. So you are looking at hacking hundreds of thousands of EVMs by passing EC procedures. Uh, I mean, unless you do it at a central location, if you have to do it in a distributed fashion, then you have to have employ an army of people who would know about this operation. So you're, basically it would mean that you have to hack them at the ECIL or at the BEL level where the EVMs are manufactured. Right. So if you say the argument could be that we are they are actually changing something over there, which therefore leads to 10% of the machines being hacked. So they have to know which 10% and then take some steps according. Look, the, in the 2004-14 elections, the, the EVMs were manufactured in Congress regime. So did such a large scale operation happen without Congress knowing? It's, it's very unlikely. Also, the, the EV. There is also the checks and balance of how the distribution of the EVMs takes place, in which the other political parties also part. Right. But, but even before that, the, uh, you have to realize that the EVMs, at least that's what the EC claims, the EVMs have, um, do have a software in them, but the software resides on what is called um, read only memory. So, uh, so they burnt it to the printer. Yeah, so, so it, can, it can only be written once during the manufacturing process and it cannot be rewritten. So this is not like a, a, a your um, a conventional com computer. Com computer where we are in a hard disk, you can go and modify stuff, right? Here, uh, you can't. So when you reboot, when you boot the EVM, the code it comes up with has only been written in the manufacturing process. So unless you are saying that the, the manufacturing, the the people who wrote the code uh, burned it into the, they are compromised. There is like assumption. Suppose hmm. worst case scenario. This 12 people in the ECIL had actually told them how to compromise the code, assuming those you know who were shot with the heart on the other side, assuming that that kind of story. It still means that because the numbering system is such, there's an alphabetical order. That alphabetical order is essentially not the parties, but the name of the candidates. Since we do not know at the manufacturing state which candidate will be on which location in the button. Therefore, it means also being able to control where these machines will go, to which booth, to the appropriate booth, so to say, so that it will match the change program. Well, before that, because these have, uh, the, the code is contained in read-only chips, you have to replace that read-only chip. Assuming chip. that, I'm going to on, the next step. On Assuming that they have replaced 10% it, it, of the chips. It's not that easy, right? Like, so you're talking about replacing chips in 100,000 EVMs stored not in one location but spread across the country and nobody coming to know during a Congress rule. This, is, this all happened during Congress rule. Let's even make that assumption. I'm going to the next step. Even after that assumption that this can be done, the next issue is that the political party's representatives actually are part of the distribution of the EVM mechanism, right. which is supposed to be randomized at two levels, which go to which states, within the state again randomized which goes to which booths uh, yeah well um, so so there is a very fairly elaborate procedure right it's um, starts with evms um, go to the state right there there is a first level check uh, the first level check all political parties are invited representatives of political parties are invited representatives come from the psus who have manufactured the evms uh, they open up the evms they do a thorough testing, checking of the parts to make sure that nothing has been replaced. In uh, presence of the representatives of political parties, um, mock polls are conducted at that point. Once the mock polls are conducted, the, the control units get sealed. Uh, so if you were to um, ha 
get into the control unit. After that, the seal will presumably be bro bro broken. Uh, beyond that, this is the first level check. Then there is a randomization process which decides which EVM goes to which, which no, which EVM goes to which assembly constitu assembly yeah. constituency. Um, now this is important because it is at the assembly or the parliamentary constituency level that the order of who of which party is first and which party is second, in, in, the order in the ballot unit, that gets decided only at the uh, at the constituency level. EB, EVM doesn't know the candidate, it only knows one, two, three, four uh, it, kind of it knows, numbers. It knows the order in the ballot unit. Yeah. And the, the order in the ballot unit is decided on the basis of your name. So it's, it's alphabetical. Lee, uh, the, the names of the candidates are listed. First the national parties, then the state parties, then the rest. And then the order is decided. So uh, so if you, want, if you want to give preference by hacking, you want to give preference to one slot in the ballot unit, then you'll have to know which, uh, which constituency that unit is assigned to. You can't do it before that because um, the, the order will change. And you also have to know what will be the other candidates there so that you will know the slot, the button number slot. Yeah, you, you will have to know your number, but you will have to know. You can only know your number when you know the other candidates of the political huh. party. So, so, so that gets, so like I said, that gets decided later. And uh, so while the this, this thing is done through a computer program, um, so again, uh, the, the computer program was written in Congress's time, so, uh, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so unless BJP was like taking over the entire government machinery without Congress knowing, these things will be highly unlikely. So what you're talking of really now today, we're not talking the 2014 election, assuming that wasn't like this, is there a question of EVM being hacked today is really what we're discussing, the 2019 poll. Well, look, if all processes at like ECIL and um, um, BEL, I think that's the other, yeah. if their entire top leadership has been compromised and um, and at different levels, engineering groups have been, because this is not like top leadership, right? Like the engineers who code, there are engineers who assemble, who test. So everybody has to unless, unless everybody is compromised, this can't happen. So Papa, you're still harping only on that issue. I'm saying, what is the responsibility of the political parties that they also have a role to see that supposing anything happens, say, supposing, then what is their role also you have to see so that if such a process, such compromise takes place, assumption, wild as it may be, they still would be able to ca catch it because they are also a part of the, shall we say, the mock poll, yeah. the randomization process and all of these. So, so, so that even if it is compromised, these would hold good and this is then still fail because it would be apparent there is a problem. Yeah, so 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 they are part of the uh, the the First of all, check where mock polls are conducted in front of them. Uh, seals are done in front of them. They are part of the first level randomization, which assigns things to uh, EVMs to constituencies. They are part of the second level randomization, which assigns from the constituencies to which booth. They are after that the ballot setting is done. During the ballot setting, another mock poll is done. They are part of that. Uh, beyond that, uh, on the polling day, before the election start, another mock poll is done and uh, they are part of that. Also, the from the time the EVMs get assigned to assembly constituencies and then to booths, uh, the candidates are notified that which booth has which serial number. So let's say an EVM was swapped, uh, the candidate should be telling their, uh, their polling agents that, uh, look, you need to go and check if the, if the serial number matches. And uh, the, the polling agent is within his rights, his or her rights, to ask for the serial number of the uh, of the EVM on the day of polling. Um, once polling is complete, the polling officer is supposed to sh close the EVM and seal it in presence of polling agents and the polling agents can sign on the seal. Uh, so all polling agents can sign on the seal. On the day of the counting, the counting agent can again ask, again ask for the serial numbers to be matched. So this is all within his rights, right? That he can verify the seals. Um, after the counting is over, um, a candidate or a counting agent can challenge um, uh, the result. Um, the challenge gets recorded, right? So it's up to the discretion of the EC to whether the challenge is honored or not, but the challenge is recorded, right? It, it goes on record so that you later file a court case 
you will have the record that you challenged it and EC overruled your challenge. Um, and there is also the VVPAT unit now, the, uh, yeah. which has a certain number of votes that you can tally it to see as a cross check right. that the, the, the voting has not been compromised. So, 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 so the VVPAT um, check can be uh, requested at two stages. So if, if you have a, uh, a voter who goes and presses a button and um, the, what comes out in the VVPAT is different from the button he, uh, he or she pressed, um, the, the voter can, can raise a challenge to the, to the polling officer and then the polling officer is required to verify that the, uh, the, the system is working properly. Um, and on the counting day, after the counting is over, a candidate can challenge a result uh, of, of any uh, EVM and then the EC is at least required to register the complaint. Whether the EC uh, then goes ahead and does a tally with the VVPAT, that's up to the discretion of the EC, but uh, the, the, there has to be a record of that, right? Now, um, the, the thing is that this is a fairly elaborate process uh, with lots of checks and balances and at least multiple points where, where candidates can challenge. Now, if you are going to now claim that large scale rigging was done in the UP elections, let's say, because after the general election, the other most uh, uh, controversial for, for the EVM conspiracy theorists is the UP election because nobody expected BJP to win such a... Then where were the challenges, right? I mean, uh, you should... you After the election result has been declared, you can go to court for a stipulated... within a stipulated period of time and challenge the result. So how come nobody went to court? How come there is no record of candidates challenging the results of the EVMs? Uh, um, so uh, these are basic legal procedures which I mean, I'm sure at least the large political parties, they have uh, uh, the ability to employ lawyers who can advise them on these, and uh, none of this was done. Instead, what we have is this thing of hearsay that uh, uh, that EVMs were hacked. You cannot make the claim based on hearsay. I mean, you have to produce some credible ed evidence to go by. When, like, without any credible evidence, how do you... Uh, make such claims. Make such claims. But beyond that, what I was... I think our viewers have to know is that it is also the responsibility of the political parties to satisfy themselves that the voting has been fair and the EVMs have been reviewed by them, how it has functioned, and they have to be educated enough to satisfy themselves of this. It is not the responsibility of the fairness of the elections rest only on the election commission. It also rests on all the political parties and on us as concerned, you know, shall we say, uh, voters who should understand what the electoral process is. Yeah. It's everybody's responsibility. But more, the, there's, on top of that, what I would want to add, especially from yesterday's conference and, and apparent Congress involvement and the reaction on social media is, it's also a responsibility to have a, a, some semblance of scientific temper, right? You can't live in your alternate reality. <laughs> you have to interact with other people. And so when you're interacting with other people, it has to be, the discourse has to be based on some reason, some logic. You, and you, some you, facts. Uh -huh, yeah. It cannot be Kanish's head was a case of, uh, uh, what is it, cosmetic surgery. <laughs> I mean, even if I take it as organ transplant, not cosmetic surgery. Or that the EVM was hacked in this particular way. Both are nonsensical claims. One pure stupidity, one a combination of stupidity with ideology, shall we say. But thank you very much, Bapa, for being with us, trying to help us and our viewers of what this EVM controversy is and what is the role of us as electors, people who cast vote as voters, and also of political parties. Apart from what uh, election commission does or doesn't do. Also, for the media to be a little more informed about the core democratic process in the country and not get into their hobby horses or their conspiracy theories, at least without any, quote unquote, as Bapa called it, scientific exercise of scientific temper, what I will call exercise of some minimum common sense. One thing I would like to add is that um, we can support this demand that um, more uh, VVPATs are automatically counted um, after the um, 
EVM counting is done. So uh, currently by default, one VVPAT is randomly uh, one EVM is randomly selected and its VVPAT uh, paper trails are matched with the EVM count. And I think um, it, it would be, it, it's a fair demand to say that instead of just one in a constituency, so in assembly constituency roughly having 250 seats, just counting one, let's say you, if you count 10% of the uh, EVMs and, and, and match uh, that the EVM count with the VVPAT count, uh, that would be a, a, a fair demand and it, it would add transparency to the, uh, to the process and it will also alleviate a lot of people's discomfort with, uh, with technology and with EVMs in general. It's more as much to satisfy people's technological disquiet yes. rather than actually the process of the election itself. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much, Bappa, for being with us. This is all the time we have for NewsClick today. Do keep watching NewsClick and we will come back with you for more issues like this, debunking myths, modern myths, as well as ancient ones.